Good morning. My name is Malcolm Kneekirk. Welcome to Fretton's second Coffee Break Briefing of 2024. It is on transactions defrauding creditors, specifically Section 423 of the Insolvency Act. I think the circular I sent out about it said that I'd be talking about Midland Bank and Wyatt. As, as you know, I do like going back over the old cases from time to time. Uh, I've actually got uh, another three or four cases that I hope to pick up on this morning, as well as Midland Bank and Wyatt. These are the themes I'm going to be talking about this morning. First of all, uh, I'll be going through section 423, looking at its components, trying to unpack it and to show you what's involved in section 423. Then I'll be looking at legal professional privilege and section 423, how they work together. After that, I'll be looking at limitation of claims, when claims become time barred under section 423. And then at the end, I'll be looking at Midland Bank and Wyatt and probably a couple of other cases at that time as well. So let's start by looking at the components of section 423. I'm going to be looking at three sections here. Section 423, 424, and section 425. 423 says what the blag is. 424 says who can do something about the blag. And 425 says what can be done about the blag. Let's start with 423. A 423 claim has got two components, a transaction at an undervalue, and that transaction must be defrauding creditors. The defrauding is in quotes here because the legislation doesn't actually say anything about defrauding creditors. That's the title to the section, but there's nothing at all about fraud or honesty or dishonesty in the legislation itself. So the title to section 423 is perhaps a little bit misleading. Subsection one defines what a transaction at an undervalue is. Uh, it's pretty much what you would expect. Uh, the, the slides will be available afterwards, so I don't propose to talk about that in any detail. Subsection three is the one that talks about defrauding creditors. And the importance of this one is it's not just enough to show that there was a transaction as an undervalue. You also have to show why there was a transaction as an undervalue, what its purpose was, and you will get home on a claim under section 423 only if you have evidence to prove that the purpose of the transaction was to prejudice people who might be going to bring a claim against the debtor or to put assets beyond their reach if they are making a claim. And you have to have evidence to prove that purpose, otherwise you will not succeed in your claim. That's what the blag is. So who can do something about the blag? Two definitions here are relevant. First one is in section 423 is the definition of a victim, which is somebody who is prejudiced by the transaction. The second relevant definition is the definition of a debtor. Again, that is back in 423 as well. And it's basically the person who entered into the undervalued transaction in the context of what we're normally looking at that's usually going to be the bankrupt or the company that is insolvent and those definitions of victim and debtor are used in section 424 which identifies those who can bring a claim under section 423 <laughs> victims have got the right to bring a claim where the debtor is in an IVA, the supervisor also has the right to bring a claim. Where the debtor is bankrupt, then the office holder or official receiver has the right to bring a claim. And in that case, where the debtor is bankrupt, the rights of the victims themselves to bring claims are restricted. They're able to bring the claim only if they have got permission of the court to do so. In other circumstances, they don't need that permission from the court. The rules are similar for corporate insolvencies where victims normally have the right to bring a claim. The supervisor of a CVA will have the right to bring a claim. But where the company is in liquidation or administration, 
it's the office holder who has the right to bring the claim primarily. The victims do still have that right, but they can only bring the claim if the court grants them permission to do so. And it's important to remember that the Section 423 claim, particularly when brought by a victim, is a collective claim. So that means that if the victim manages to get the transaction set aside, they're not entitled to seize the value of the property that's come back for themselves. That property has to be made available for everybody who has been prejudiced by the transaction. That, of course, happens automatically by virtue of the pari passu rule if there's a formal insolvency. But otherwise, it's something that the court will have to take into account when it, it gives the order for the remedy. And Section 425 uh, says what remedies the court have got. Again, when looking at Section 425, I'm going to start by going back to Section 423 itself, because Section 423 contains the general principles. There are two components to a court order under Section 423. Firstly, it should restore the, the, the position as if there had been no undervalued transaction. And secondly, the order should protect the interests of the victims. There's the, the list from section 425 of the various remedies the courts have got. I don't propose to go through those in any detail. They will be on the handout that will be circulated afterwards. It's important to remember that section 425 does explicitly give you the right to make a claim against somebody other than the bankrupt and the company itself. You are entitled to chase the money, to chase where the asset has gone, to make a claim against whoever has got it. But that is limited because you're not allowed to make a claim against innocent third parties. And in this case, an innocent third party is somebody who has bought the property for value, doesn't have to be for full value or fair value, but value must have changed hands. So somebody who bought the property for value in good faith and without knowing about the relevant circumstances. The relevant circumstances are not defined, but they're going to be any sort of involvement with the transaction itself uh, is going to is going to paint the the, the knowledge that the that the third party has got. But essentially this is intended to protect the innocent. So that it's, it's only those who are, if you like, the accomplices to the, uh, the, the debtor setting up the transaction in the first place, who are the likely people to claim against. And again, a reminder, it is a class action, it is a collective action. The order that the court makes to restore the position will be to try and make sure that all of the victims of the transaction get a share of it. Not important for the court to do that when it's an office holder bringing the claim, but it might be if it is a victim bringing the claim themselves. So that's section 423 itself that I've looked at. Let's look now at professional privilege and section 423. A quick reminder about what legal professional privilege actually is. It's inherent in your right to have legal advice that everything you tell your lawyer should be confidential so that you can explain the circumstances and what you're trying to do, warts and all, and so that your lawyer, their advice to you should also be confidential so that they can tell you whether what you're trying to do is going to work or not. You, can, you will know if you have a bad case, and there is a public interest there in ensuring that people know that they have a bad case before they start, just as a way of making sure that people are discouraged from setting off on litigation that's going to go nowhere. And the whole point of privilege is that that privileged advice is not disclosed in litigation. Although in litigation you do have an obligation, both sides have an obligation to disclose to the other all of the documents that they've got that are relevant to the case so that the, the, the judge can make an informed decision having seen all of the facts. You're not allowed to conceal facts 
from the the other side. What you are allowed to conceal from the other side is the legal advice that you have received. There are two cases I want to talk about. One of them is a very old case, Barclays Bank and Eustace. The other one is not so old, uh, the Lemos case. Starting with Barclays and Eustace. Mr. Eustace was a farmer and his farm was financed by, by Barclays. He got into financial difficulties and he then engaged consultants to try and help him out, who set up a scheme that was actually quite common for farmers uh, in the early 90s. And what Mr Eustace did, having spoken to these consultants, is he created agricultural tenancies over the farm in favour of members of his family and he then sold his tractors and other agricultural equipment to members of his family on very very favourable terms. Now the significance of the agricultural tenancies is this, he was able to grant agricultural tenancies for 12 months without needing to ask Barclays Bank for permission because he had that right to grant short tenancies without asking Barclays for permission, Barclays, despite having a mortgage on the property, were bound by the tenancies that Mr Eustace had created. And because they were agricultural tenancies, the tenants, remember these tenants were all members of his family, the tenants had security of tenure. So although it was a 12 month tenancy, they were entitled to renew it and keep renewing it and essentially would be there for life. The result of this was that when Barclays appointed receivers, they discovered that somebody else was in occupation of the farm and that somebody else was a member of Mr Eustace's family and they weren't paying very much rent for it. And this had an effect firstly on the ability of the receivers to collect rent to pay the interest that was due to Barclays because the rent that was coming in was not enough to cover the interest. And secondly, it affected Barclays' right to sell the farm and get its money back because the farm, subject to these agricultural tenancies, was worth very much less than the amount that they were owed by Mr Eustace. So, Barclays decided to use section 423 to try and set aside both the agricultural tenancies and also the sale of the farm equipment. And during the course of the court case, Barclays asked for disclosure of the legal advice that Mr Eustace had had. Now this wasn't advice from the consultants who had first been involved in planning the scheme, it was advice from the solicitors who actually implemented it. Barclays thought that this advice would be likely to explain the reason for the transaction, why Mr Eustace had set it up. Now, the, the, the judge was very, very unimpressed with all of this and quickly came to the conclusion that it looked highly likely that the reason for setting up these transactions was to prejudice the interest of Barclays. Thought it was quite likely that it was done so that Mr Eustace would be trying to ensure that he and his family continued to occupy the farm and if as a consequence of that it meant that Barclays were left unable to recover the money that they had lent to him, it seemed that Mr Eustace wasn't too concerned about that. The court thought that this was inequitous and used the phrase deliberate sharp practice in the judgment and had no qualms at all about putting this case in that category of circumstances where the wrongdoing is such that it is pretty close to being fraud and one of the exceptions to legal privilege is that if you're involved in something which is akin to fraud you're not entitled to rely on legal privilege to keep confidential the advice that you were given in setting up a scheme like that. 
Let's look at the, the Lemos case now, which is much more recent, 2017. This started as a dispute between a brother and a sister. He owed her, it was about $18 million. He got judgment against him and she tried to recover her money by forcing the sale of the large house in Hampstead that he owned. That house was owned by a Liberian corporation. He had in the past been a significant shareholder in it, but in 1994, he had put his shares in trust for his wife. He went bankrupt uh, in 2015, so that was more than 20 years after the trust was set up, and his sister made a claim against him following year 2016 under section 423 to try and take apart that trust and bring the shares back into his estate. Now, the trustees of his bankrupt estate had got a number of documents from Mr. Lemos. They were in their possession. And they were entitled to those documents because they were Mr. Lemos's property. They had vested in the trustees of the bankrupt estate. And the trustees said, in effect, look, these documents are our property. Surely that means that we are therefore entitled to waive privilege in them, and we would like to waive privilege and effectively pass these documents to Mr. Lemos's sister and say to her, you may use these in your claim against your brother. The trustees quite properly asked the court for directions to confirm that they were entitled to do that. And in this particular case, the judge ruled that they could not. And one of the factors weighing on the judge's mind with all of this was they described legal professional privilege as being essentially a fundamental human right. And it should not be possible as a general rule for somebody else to waive privilege on your behalf. It's a, it's, a, it's a personal right rather than a property right was how they looked at it. So that was a, quite a different decision to that in the Eustace case where the court were quite happy to waive privilege. And I'll just add as a footnote to the Lemos case that this actually went to trial last summer and the courts then ruled that there was actually a legitimate purpose to the trust. Therefore, they we're not going to set it aside under Section 423 because it was not the, the, the transfer of shares to Mrs. Lemos was not done for the purposes of putting assets beyond the reach of, of creditors. So what's the difference between the Barclays Bank and Eustace and the, the Lemos case? Well, it might be that human rights are now more influential than they were in 1995. It might be that Mr. Eustace's case, on the face of it, seemed to have been so transparently set up for the sole purpose of defeating Barclays security. Uh, and in the Lemos case, there was that absence of sharp practice. The, the, the reasons for setting up the trust seemed to be very, very complicated very long ago, uh, and that sharp practice was not there. Let's move on from legal professional privilege now and look at when 423 claims become time barred. And this actually is one reason why office holders often bring claims under 423 rather than, for example, bringing them as a transaction at an undervalue. If you're bringing a claim as a transaction at an undervalue, you can only go back in time for a limited period. It's two years in corporate insolvencies, five years in a bankruptcy. If you're bringing a claim in section 423, you can go back to the beginning of time to unscramble the transaction that you're interested in. It doesn't matter how long ago that transaction took place, you still have the right to challenge it under section 423. There's the other aspect to claims being time barred as well, which is how long have you got to bring that claim once you are in office? And the rule here is that the time is different for office holders 
than it would be if you were a victim bringing the claim. I'm not going to talk about how long victims have got to bring the claim, but as far as office holders are concerned, you have six years from the start of the liquidation or bankruptcy to bring a claim if it's money that you're trying to recover, 12 years from the start of the insolvency if it's property that you're trying to recover. That's all I'm going to say about limitation. I'm now going to move on to the old case of Midland Bank and Wyatt, and there's a couple of other cases I'd like to talk about as well. Midland Bank and Wyatt, it is an old case, 1995. It was a very, very familiar story. Husband and wife bought a house together. They had a mortgage on it. They had some personal unsecured borrowing as well. After a while, the husband set up his own company. And very soon after he set up his own business, he and his wife signed a trust deed that transferred the equity in the family home to his wife and their two children. So from that point onwards, according to this trust deed, he no longer had any interest at all in the family home. <coughs> the, the bank then increased the borrowing that he had. It was all unsecured borrowing. The bank thought that he was a man of sufficient means to be able to repay that, that borrowing. They thought that there was enough equity in the property that they would be repaid anyway. And after a while, the business went into receivership. And at that point, the bank still knew nothing at all about this trust deed. They thought their record showed that the family home was owned equally by Mr. and Mrs. Wyatt. When he produced this trust deed to show that he was unable to repay them because he owned nothing, they then wanted to challenge it under section 423. And the court set aside the trust deed in this case. They did so on two grounds. Firstly, they said it's not even a legitimate document. You never told the bank about it. You never referred to it in correspondence. In fact, when you wrote to the bank, you suggested that you and your wife owned the property equally. And you signed other documents, uh, other property documents, which are completely inconsistent with the house being in the name of your wife and your children. So the trust deed is a sham. It's not a genuine document. It's not a truthful document. We're going to set it aside on those grounds. And also, having decided it's not a truthful document, it's not an honest document, we're going to set it aside under section 423 as well, because it, we just don't regard it as a legitimate transaction. Let's have a look at the Wotherspoon case. And, and yes, this is spelt right. Um, and this was a little bit different. Here, Mr. Wotherspoon was going to get married and he and his future wife decided where they were going to live he bought the property in his sole name. He said the intention had always been that they would put it into joint names, but it took him eight years after they got married for him to get around to doing it. No particularly good reason. It wasn't difficult to do. There wasn't even a mortgage on the property. He put it in joint names in 2001, and then seven years later, it was transferred out of joint names into his wife's sole name. No explanation given as to why they did that. And he kept a restriction on the property at the land registry, which meant that he effectively would have had a veto over any sale of it. Didn't explain what interest that restriction protected or why he had that restriction, but nevertheless, he had it. A year or so later, he started to get into arrears with his taxes. He'd had no problem until then, had always paid in full and on time. Problems got worse, and in 2013, HMRC served him with a statutory demand. A few days after that, his wife sold the property and used the proceeds of sale to buy another one, also in her sole name. And the following year, he was made bankrupt following presentation of a petition by HMRC. 
the trustee of the bankrupt estate brought a claim under section 423 to try and claim back that transaction where the property had been put into his wife's sole name. The court decided in this particular case that the evidence they had from Mr. and Mrs. Wotherspoon was unconvincing. They didn't think that they were getting the whole story or necessarily the truthful story from Mr. and Mrs. Wotherspoon. But there was nothing in the trustee's story to show that Mr. Wotherspoon had been concerned about paying his taxes in the future when he had put the property into his wife's name. And therefore, the trustee had not proven that there was not a legitimate purpose for the transaction. And the court could not infer a, a purpose. The court couldn't jump to a conclusion about that. So therefore, despite being unconvinced by the evidence from Mr. and Mrs. Wotherspoon, there was no order made under Section 423. The third and last case is Sands and Clitheroe. Mr. Clitheroe was a solicitor, and he was promoted to become a partner in his law firm. His senior partner told him that now you're a partner, my boy, you've got to put your property into your wife's name. We all do this. It's to make sure that if we get hit by a massive negligence claim, we don't lose our homes. So a few years later, in 1988, Mr. Clitheroe sold the house that he owned with his wife and they, they moved house. The new house was bought in her sole name. Fifteen years later, he became bankrupt. And Mark Sands, as trustee of the bankrupt estate, brought a claim under Section 423 to claim back half of the value of the property that had been lost when the replacement family home was bought in his wife's sole name. And the court decided in this particular case that quite transparently the purpose of the transaction had been to put the property beyond the reach of claims by clients of the law firm. And it might be that the judge might have come to the conclusion that by having this policy about partners who own almost nothing, perhaps it meant that the, the firm was carrying less professional insurance than they otherwise might have done, and they weren't being quite as diligent in protecting their clients' interests as they might have done. I don't know. It's not in the judgment itself, but that might have been part of it. There were a couple of issues in the judgment about how risky a law firm is as against other types of businesses, such as a dupe speculation, which was referred to in, in, in one of the earlier cases, and the fact that Mr. Clitheroe had been solvent at the time of the transaction. This was because this was only 20 years after the Insolvency Act had come into force. It was still slightly untried and untested, and there were references being made to the previous regime of transactions defrauding creditors where those sorts of issues would have been relevant. But here, yes, the transfer was reversed. The claim of the trustee was successful. So let's see if we can work out what the difference is between these three cases. Midland Bank and Wyatt, it was clear from documents after the date of the Declaration of Trust that Mr. and Mrs. Wyatt weren't really living their lives as if that declaration of trust was a genuine transaction. So it was hard to give very much credibility to it. Wotherspoon is, to my mind, the interesting case here because it really underscores the need for you as an office holder to have evidence when you bring a claim under Section 423. You can't just say, look, the effect of the claim was to put assets beyond the reach of creditors was to prejudice the interest of creditors. You've got to show that that was the why, that was the purpose of the claim was to do that. And in Wotherspoon, the trustee didn't have the evidence to do that. And that was, that was a case where the defense against that claim was not particularly well organized. And Sands and Clitheroe, again, here, it was quite easy to show the purpose, um, even though the transaction had been 15 years before the bankruptcy. So those are the four points that I wanted to cover. Um, if you have any questions, then let's see, we seem to have some questions. Yes, we've got a, um, 
a comment here from Susan Brown of, 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 of Council, just emphasizing legal privilege applies to all confidential communications with your lawyer, uh, where the dominant purpose is to seek or record legal advice just to assist. There is also litigation privilege, which protects communications for legal advice or recording legal advice made in reasonable contemplation of, of litigation. Absolutely right. There are these two classes of, 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 of privilege. Um, I suspect that the privilege could be an entire series of coffee break briefings of its own. But, but Susan, thank you very much for those, those comments. Just moving on to show you now a picture of a pub sign with a pig on it. Why am I showing you that? That's the pub sign for the Empress of Blandings. And this is a, a date for your diary. Thursday this week, we've got the R3 regional meeting um, at the Empress of Blandings, which is conveniently close to both Junction 1 and Junction 2 of the M27. I'll be speaking at that with a couple of former colleagues of mine who are also giving presentations. If you haven't yet booked and it is convenient for you, it's free, why not book now? Just Google R3 Empress of Blandings and you should come to the, the page for that. Next month's coffee break briefing, I will be talking about MVLs without HMRC clearance. You'll have seen the, the, the publicity about HMRC deciding that they are now not going to give clearance in MVLs anymore. So I'll be just talking through some of what I see as the implications of that. Next date I've got is a plug for somebody else's conference. David Kirk is organizing the Southwestern Conference in Exeter on the 18th of May. That looks like it's got a good program. It's got good speakers like Nick O'Reilly and Bill Birch, amongst others. There's another former colleague of mine speaking at that as well. So if Exeter is convenient for you, drop David a, an email if you haven't already got details about that, to say because that does look like a, a good conference. I'll also say that there is the first of this year's Seska's seminars at Denby's Vineyard in Dorking on the 23rd of May. I won't be at the Southwestern Conference. I will be at the Seska seminar. I am speaking at that one. Most important date for your diary is the 7th of June, which is our insolvency conference. This year, we're going to be holding it in Brockenhurst, right in the center of the New Forest. Very easy to get the train out of Waterloo to, to Brockenhurst. It's a fast mainline service there. Um, it's on a Friday, so if you wanted to stay and make a long weekend of it and enjoy the weekend in the New Forest, you've got the chance to do that as well. Last two dates is the Seska Conference at Reading University on the 12th and 13th of September. I will be presenting at that and I'll also be presenting at the Denbys, the, the Seska Seminar at Denbys on the 10th of October. So, so all dates there for your diary. Finish off with my contact details and uh, those of my colleague Harvey. And with that, I'll say thank you all very much. And I'll see you maybe on Thursday. If not, I hope then Monday next month for the coffee break briefing then. So thank you all very much and goodbye.